here we go uh oh -uh, you didn't turn on all the lights oh, okay wow that is bright good morning everybody good morning. oh it's okay turn it down oh yeah Ava good morning okay today is a very very beautiful feast right November 1st is the feast of or the, all days. It, it, it's not only a feast day it's a solemnity in the church okay so what's the distinction what is a solemnity I don't know you don't know okay and that's why I asked so I can explain a solemnity is just as the word says a solemn a solemn commemoration of a feast and that is not to say that the other feasts are not <coughs> solemn or are not important but uh, a solemnity uh, in the church is is a feast that has a um, how do you say it uh, a greater importance a feast of greater importance and that is why um, that is why it is a holiday of obligation Okay, so just a reminder to everybody, it's a holiday of obligation. So we Catholics go to Mass, make it a point to go to Mass uh, on this day, November 1st, to commemorate and to give thanks to God for all the saints. So this is the day that we um, commemorate everyone who is in heaven. It's not only a day for those who were proclaimed as saints, because as you know, uh, since we all have a calling through our baptism, a calling to become saints, we all have an obligation to try to pursue sanctity, which means we all have the obligation, the duty, the calling to go to heaven, the invitation to go to heaven. That's what being a saint means. <clears throat> okay? So it's important for us to understand that is what sanctity is all about. It's responding to the call of Jesus to live holy lives through our ordinary everyday circumstances so that we may turn every ordinary thing in this life into an extraordinary means to go to heaven. To do anything ordinary extraordinarily well <clears throat> so that that may lead us to heaven which is our final home, our final destination. So today's solemnity is a commemoration of everybody who made it to heaven, even if they were not proclaimed by the church as saints, because, you know, those who have been named as saints are a very, very small percentage of the population of heaven. Those who have been named and proclaimed and proposed to us uh, by the church as being saints are are uh, only those who the church has chosen to propose as models for us to emulate okay it doesn't mean to say that those are the only number of saints that are in heaven there are numerously numerously uh, more um, saints in heaven who we do not know who we do not know many of them would be our own relatives, our own friends, who just have not been proclaimed as saints. But we are confident that they're also in heaven if they led good lives, if they led holy lives, if they uh, performed their duties, uh, the duties of their vocation uh, very well on earth. God will reward them with heaven. And that's, our, that's also our hope. That's also the hope that all of us have that's also the goal we are all working for. We are all working towards, right? To get to heaven. So today is that day when we remember all of those who have gone ahead of us and are in heaven. And we give thanks to God for all their lives and for the good example that they give us. Okay? So, but then today we're also going to try to finish all the mysteries of the rosary and we have one left. We have one mystery left that we have not uh, <clears throat> talked about and that is the fifth joyful, joyful mystery, mystery of the rosary. And that mystery is the finding of the child Jesus in the temple. <clears throat> finding of the child Jesus in the temple. 
So, you know, uh, how do we think about this? How do I contemplate this mystery? What do I think about? I imagine Jesus as a young 12-year-old boy, okay, who was a little adventurous, okay? He was a little adventurous and maybe, maybe, uh, you know, uh, playing a little mischief, okay? Like any normal 12-year-old boy, okay? Uh, would would want to would want to experiment and, and, and test his limits. Yes, Ava. <laughs> yes, Ava. So, when he was twelve years old, uh, his parents, uh, Joseph and Mary, okay, took him to the temple because uh, that was a custom among uh, pious Jews. They would make pilgrimages to Jerusalem uh, in order to uh, you know participate with the feast. In Jerusalem so when Jesus was 12 years old they thought okay uh, he's ready to make this trip so let's take him little did they know that Jesus had a little plan that he didn't tell them he didn't tell them he had a plan and what was his plan he had planned to stay behind and to perhaps uh, test the waters and see if he is ready to uh, to start preaching, okay? Uh, you know, Jesus was a normal boy, so he wanted to also experiment on his own capabilities, and he also wanted to uh, to uh, uh, have adventure one way or another. And he thought maybe this was my chance; I can do a little adventure here in Jerusalem. And so he went ahead, and you know, uh, during those days. Uh, parents didn't have to be very protective among uh, about their children. See, um, uh, uh, you know they they were not in so much danger of either getting lost or kidnapped or whatever uh, problems we have with society now. That's why we are very protective of our own children. But maybe those problems didn't exist in Jesus's time. So Jesus was free to roam Jerusalem. He was just going around and you know uh, mingling with people. And so. On the, on the by the time it was uh, time to go home, Mary and Joseph thought, and you know, the, uh, uh, in the caravans they were walking in caravans. The men would go together, and the women would go together, and the children would just you know mill around and uh, be among their friends. That was how free they were to be moving about in in a caravan, right? Going going home or going wherever they were going. So this time the feast was over. So the caravan going back to Nazareth uh, went its way. And, uh, and Mary and Joseph were among their own neighbors and they were walking, walking, walking. But after a day's walk, when it was time to sleep, they started looking for Jesus. Say, oh, where is Jesus? Where is Jesus? He was nowhere to be found. They were looking for him among the, their neighbors, their friends. He was nowhere to be found. So I could imagine the anguish of Our Lady, the anguish of St. Joseph. See? They must have been terrified that, that, that they left Jesus behind somewhere or he got lost somewhere along the way. So Jesus and Mary, I mean, sorry, Joseph and Mary decide to walk back to take that journey of a day's walk already back into Jerusalem to look for Jesus. So three days he was lost. They were moving about in Jerusalem, looking everywhere they could find him or they thought he might be. But no, no sign of him anywhere. And you know where they found him? Yeah, in the temple. But where and among what company? Hmm? He was with the teachers. Okay? He was with, maybe he was among the elders. Maybe he was among the Pharisees and the scribes. But he was described to have been among the elders of the Jews. And what was he doing? He was interacting with them. He was maybe exchanging uh, notes with them and discussing with them. And talking to them about the kingdom of God. See? Maybe he was already practicing 
See, he was already practicing the way he was going to uh, reveal himself to the rest of the world. Okay? And he was also listening to them and finding out how much they knew about him and, how, and, and what it is that they are talking about when they talk about God. Okay? I could imagine Jesus there sitting and interacting with all these elders. And they must have been so amazed about how smart Jesus was and how much he knew about the scriptures. Right? It's just like you. When I test you on the catechism, okay, I sometimes get amazed at how much you know about your catechism or how much you don't know sometimes. But you know, these elders must have been so amazed with how much Jesus also knew about the scriptures. Right? And then all of a sudden, the door opens and there you have Mary and Joseph. Okay? Visibly troubled, anxious, okay? and fearful of having lost Jesus. And the consolation that must have dawned on them when they saw him after three days of losing him. And what does Our Lady tell Jesus? Our Lady says, You have not done well this time. Your father and I have been looking for you. Why did you do this? Why did you just leave without telling us? And what does our Lord tell them? Well, Mother, didn't you know that I'm supposed to be about my father's business? So here is Jesus reminding his own mother that this is the reason I came to earth for. It is to preach, to reveal the Godhead. <clears throat> And Our Lady perhaps did not understand what Jesus meant. Perhaps in her mind she was saying, It's much too early, son. It's much too early. You're too young to do this. So please, come home. Come home to us. <coughs> and look at what Jesus does. The Gospel says, Erat subitus ilis. Erat subitus ilis. He was subject to them. Meaning, he obeyed. He obeyed. He obeyed his human parents. He was God. He could have done anything. He could have sent his own parents home and said, Well, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm supposed to be about my father's business here. So that's what I'm doing. And I'm God, okay? By the way, I'm God. So you can go home now. And I can take care of myself. If Jesus were cocky, you know, if Jesus were proud, if Jesus were, well, thought he knew everything he needed to know, maybe that's how, how he could have dismissed his parents, ignored them. But no, Jesus shows us the marvelous example of obedience to his parents. Obedience to his own creatures. He was the one who created this couple. Yet, he obeys. Yet, he submits himself. Yet, he subjects himself to their will. Not to his own whims, not to his own likings, not to his own preferences. He submits himself to his own parents. Now, I guess you little ones ought to learn from the example of Jesus. Obedience, obedience, obedience. You can never get tired of my having to remind you about the virtue of obedience. If Jesus himself showed us 
the example of obedience, we cannot do anything less. You know, obedience is among the virtues that all the saints whose feast we celebrate today have lived up to very well. Because Jesus himself was obedient from the moment he was born. He was already obeying everything that Joseph and Mary told him and did for him. Okay? Obedient from the time he was born to the time of his death. Remember the agony in the garden. What did he say to his father God? See? Please take away this cup from me. But if it is your will, then thy will be done. See, thy will be done. Obedience, obedience, obedience. Same thing is true with Our Lady. Right? Fiat, fiat, thy will be done, he told the angel. She told the angel. Right? To convey to God, thy will be done. Joseph. When he was awoke, awoke, awakened by, by, by the angel, go, take, take the, the child and, and his mother and go into Egypt. He obeyed without even knowing what it was all about. There are plenty of stories in the Gospels about obedience, obedience, obedience. Obedience is a very important virtue. And here, our Lord manifests to us the obedience of a child. The obedience of a 12-year-old adventurous little boy, see, who wanted to push the limits of up to where he can go. Yet, in the end, he settles for obedience and obeys his own parents. It's a beautiful, beautiful example. Okay? And that's it for us, folks, today. It's November 1st, so those among you listening in this call... Uh, don't forget to go to Mass. Okay? And we're off to Mass right now. Bye-bye. Bye! -bye. Bye. Have a good day.